scriptures over to uh, Acts chapter 18. We're going to start there. And I'm going to read the first 17 verses. We're continuing with Paul's journeys. Uh, I remember years ago when I preached through this series, uh, I got to about here and I quit. And, and I've done this like three times in my ministry, preached through Acts. And we're going to go to the end of Acts. I might take a break for Christmas. We're going to do something a little different for the four Sundays of Advent. But, uh, but I want us to continue to look into the life of the early church, certainly Paul. But it's so much more. And so let's continue to uh, seek what the Lord has for us today. Uh, I want to talk this morning uh, how to take the bite out of fear. This is a good week, just after the election and all of our... Have you guys been kind of like this this week? Kind of going, what's going on? Is my candidate going to get elected? My favorite senator, my favorite representative, my president, right? And so we've been a little, a little nervous maybe this week. Let's talk about how those create fears for us today. Listen to how Paul went through some of that in, in this latest episode. He's in Corinth, and so we start at 18 and verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila and a native of Pontus, who had recently came from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Can I stop there for a minute? I'm not even going to mention this in the message, I don't think. To have Aquila and Priscilla, two of the most beautiful people, if you read them in the, new, in the latter part of the book of Acts, you're just meeting them for the first time today. Uh, they were ordered to leave Rome. There's seasons in our life that are very difficult. This is a couple who were moving into Port Huron because they'd been, they'd been thrown out of Lansing or wherever, you know. They were in a foreign land now, and yet you don't even, I don't even see a, a, a word of fear or worry from them. We continue. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook off his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. Come on, from, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Gallio was about, while Gallio was proconsul of uh, Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul, and brought him to the place of judgment. This man they charged is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as, most, just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews are making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions or words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be the judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. I'm sure it was interesting to Paul to uh, not see uh, Sosthenes beaten before the people, for he had endured the same in the past. But it sure was a reminder to Paul how out of control sometimes things get. There are fears in our land. What does it mean to live in fear? You face fears at times, like I do. And God helps us, doesn't he? He helps us through our, 
fears. He says, fear not. How many times in Scripture? A whole lot. Sometimes we, sometimes we feel fear failure, maybe. Sometimes we fear success. <laughs> Whoa, it worked. Now what? Right? Sometimes life is that way. You know? I got the job. Oh, boy. Now I hope I can do the job, right? You know? Those are sometimes our feelings. President Roosevelt said in, early in his life, he said, he said, the only thing to fear is fear itself. You know that quote, don't you? We all know it. Do you know the context in which it was said? I think you should know. President Roosevelt said it, and early in his life, Roosevelt grew up an aristocrat. He was among the elite, if you will. Uh, you might remember him as a president who served from a wheelchair. I only saw the pictures. I was not alive, okay? <laughs> but there's more to the story here. Before polio struck Roosevelt, he served as assistant secretary to the Navy and as a senator. It was after those achievements that polio hit Roosevelt as they told him he would never walk again. But he did. He had to learn how to walk with braces. He was twisted with pain. It was a serious case of polio. He regained the use of his hands in time, and with braces he could walk a bit. Eight years later, he became governor of New York State in his wheelchair. He did. And just after 11 years from contracting polio, he became our President of the United States. When Roosevelt took his oath of office, America was in the middle of its own depression. Yeah. It was facing its greatest fears. And the courage of a nation was crucial at this time. So it was probably a, a, a very poignant moment for God to allow a man in a wheelchair who would struggle to his feet as President of the United States and pen those words and speak those words for the first time. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. They were looking at a man who had overcome. They were looking at a man who had courage in light of insurmountable odds. And that was the season where they had to come out of that depression as difficult as it was. What's going to bring us out of our fearful times? What will it take? Who will lead us? Who will show us the way? Listen to this uh, definition of fear and then a definition of courage. And then we'll kind of unpack this, this passage. With. First of all, fear. Fear is the agitated state of mind that cripples us from looking any further than the hardship itself. You get that? It keeps you from looking further than the hardship. Life has ended. I'm over. You know? I, I, remember when, I remember when certain newscasters grieved online with tears when President Trump was elected four years ago. And we saw tears flow this time when President Biden was announced as the president-elect. Now, all of that still has to work itself out. I know that. There's a whole storyline there. But I'm just, uh, it just reveals, again, how we get so emotional, so caught up, that we can't see past something. We're so grieved over something, and we get stuck in fear. But here's the definition of courage. Courage is the state of mind that enables one to face hardship and disaster with confidence and resolution. We're going to make it through. I know it looks like a Red Sea wall. <laughs> Can you imagine the Israelites when they were they're backed up against the Red Sea? And, and Moses, God said, Moses, put your staff down into the water and I'll spread the waters for you. You know, when, when Moses did all of that, what happened the five minutes before, the hour before, the two hours before, when the, when the, the Egyptians were coming after them? And... And they had to decide, are they going to live in fear or are they going to live in courage? And, and those are the moments when we have our, our backs against the Red Sea. And God says, listen, just listen to me for a moment. 
I'm going to save you. I'm going to take care of you. And then the Red Sea parts. I I've seen the movie. Okay, there's different depictions. Whether it was a straight up wall, or whether the waters were just pushed back, or whether they were pushed back one way from the, the east wind, those are all things that, that, that happened one way or another. But we know this, the Israelites had to walk through that river bottom. I don't know about you, but I'd be walking through that river bottom, and I'd be asking the question, Moses, did God say how long the waters would be would be back for us to pass through, you know? I mean, those are just fears that we would have. Hey, I'd be, I'd, I'd be glancing just a little bit. If we glanced at the wall, would that be the same as Peter walking on the water and then looking at the water and then, oh, of course, falling in? And Jesus had to save them. Who knows? But none of that happened, of course. They were saved. The difference between fear and courage. Let me share with you this morning four assurances when you experience fear, as I see them in this passage. The first assurance that you can have confidence in when you experience fear is to keep on speaking. Keep on speaking. Um, don't be silent. Talk about it. Work through it. Now, I know some of us are extroverts, some of us are introverts, some of us talk too long. You know, I try to shorten my sermons. But some of us don't talk much at all. We're just quiet people. That's okay. But we do need to keep on expressing ourselves, keep on speaking. It will help you and give you assurance. In verse 9, our text, it says, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. There it is. You see, God wants us to keep doing the things, whether it's by voice or by action. Keep Keep serving me. I've had people come to me and say, uh, Pastor or Sir, if they're not part of our church, maybe, they would say, I only got four days left in my house and I'm going to be evicted and I need some help. I said, Wow, that's good news. You know where you're staying for the next four days. Now, that's not very nice, is it? But I think sometimes we have to have confidence because. There's a resolution. First of all, Jesus could come back on the third day and you're good. All right, I'm just trying to see the positive side, aren't I? But, I mean, sometimes you just got to talk things through and bring encouragement because there is encouragement surrounding us if we will see it. And within encouragement is that word courage. We have to speak up. Sometimes when we think if I am silent... They won't know how I feel, and therefore, I won't be, like, rejected. I'm just going to hide how I feel. Well, see, there's a problem with that. We have to sleep with that same person who didn't express themselves to work out their issues, whatever they're worrying about or fearing. You see, it's crucial that we speak up. We have just come through a political climate that has been nothing short of threatening. Are there issues that you have stood up for? It's hard to speak up during these days, especially politics. It's very hard, isn't it? Have you had an opinion? Let's change the subject. Okay, let's get off politics. Have you had, has anyone had an opinion about these masks? Yeah. Anyone had an opinion of, about these? This is my fancy. This is a, I think I'm going to get one gold plated someday. Or, you know. <laughs> What's your opinion about these masks? Have you expressed your opinion? Okay. When's the last time you expressed your opinion about something where life is lost? Something a little more important than masks? I don't know why it's just come to me, but in this last couple of months, I've been grieving more and talking more to people about the unborn of our land. I'm thinking of the I did the numbers. 50 million children have been aborted in the United States. That's the numbers now since 1973 from various counts, and you can get different counts. 50 million voices. And I thought this week, they didn't get to vote. They took their voting rights away. They, they were considered illegal immigrants. 
Am I speaking a little too harshly? I hope not. But you see, when we begin to grapple with the issues of life and say, those things make me mad. I want to help change that. And we don't apologize to the Free Methodist Church. Right in our discipline, we take a stand and we are pro-life. We know that that creates a difficult conversation. And it's not an easy one. And we're not pointing fingers today. But we struggle. We struggle with things that matter to us. We need to speak. Speaking our heart, even when people don't want to hear it. But say it with love. I believe one of the real injustices today is how Christians complain about things so close to home that affect them, that they, but they, you never hear them talk about injustices that don't affect them, that hurt other people. Sometimes we just think about ourselves a little too much. If things matter to God, then they should matter to us. We're talking about assurances in the midst of a fear. And one solution is just to speak up. Swallowing your words when you know the truth will eat you up inside. It hurts you. I'm not talking about speaking up and judging. I think one of the greatest examples was Jesus. Read the Gospels and watch Jesus speak up and convict. But he didn't judge. Excuse me. He didn't judge. He didn't judge. Jesus had a way of speaking in ways where, I love the story of the woman at the well. It's one of my favorite stories because Jesus spoke so much truth to her. And yet in the middle of that whole conversation, it's just laced with grace. I have a devotional this morning. You know how I love J.B. Walt and seabed.net. You can check out that devotional. What, what J.D. said this morning, he used the word grace and truth. Uh, and he has a perspective about how we separate those two words. Those two words cannot be separated when you talk about Jesus. Jesus spoke the truth with grace. Sometimes we want grace that everything's going to be okay. Let everybody do what they want to do. And other people are like, here's the truth, and here's my whip to prove it. See? And we have to be careful of, of those being separate. Separate. So we're talking about speaking up. One of my favorite people in my ministry, sorry, I have favorites. One of my favorite people in ministry is Frances Boone. Uh, I wanted to talk to Judy. She's not here. She's at Children's Church. But Judy and I got to know Frances in our first church in Linden, Michigan, uh, after he was pastor at Davis, my first pulpit. And so Linden was my uh, first pulpit church, and, and uh, I had to hire a secretary. Something had gone very wrong in the church before I got there. And there was no secretary and there were some issues. So I had to hire a secretary that was kind of safe. And Frances was 65 years old. I interviewed her and I said, you're hired. Because she was 65. <laughs> Forgive me if you're 65, it didn't mean to be offensive. But I was 30 at the time. And there was just some concerns in the church and this was a safe choice. Francis became such a good friend to us as a church and as a, as a pastor. She led a ministry, not part of our church, called CAP. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called Citizens Against Pornography. I think I've told you about this before. Maybe. But Francis was on a mission. She would talk to me. Sometimes I had to remind Francis, Francis, this is not the CAP office, okay? You can't, you, you can't use this office for that all the time. But she was a great secretary. She took good care of us. But when she was doing her uh, lay ministry, she was out. She had state senators speaking for her. She had representatives coming in for her. She would make me go to the rallies. I wanted to go. But she would make me stand up in front of the crowd and be the kind of the chaplain. I'd pray. And she would say, this is my pastor, and don't you mess with him. That's about how she said it. And she was one serious lady. And, and sometimes we just had to have a little conversation in our office about that. But, but she was good at that. And you know, she told me, she says, Pastor, you guys can't deal with this. This is too close to home for men. You, the, the, the women of our culture, we've got to take over this. She says, I have to watch movies sometimes. 
and I watch it for child pornography, and then I turn it into the prosecutors, and they develop cases to prosecute. She keeps the child pornography out of our stores. Now we have to worry about it online, don't we? That's a whole other deal. This was, this was Francis Boone's way of speaking up. Do you know how strong-willed this woman was? When she was 85, Lyndon had a birthday party for her, and I went back after many years and celebrated it with her, an open house, and it was that, that was their way to get her to step down from secretary. They couldn't get her to step down. But she was, she was a neat lady. Folks, speaking up will help you through your fears. Find something that matters to God and you and go for it. Go for it. It'll help you with your fears. Number two, I'll try to move quicker. I guess there is a verse there. John 8, 32. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You can't know the truth if you're not reading it or speaking it or sharing it or receiving it. It's both. Okay, number two. Know that God is with you. This is a second assurance that helps you work through your fear. Know that God is with you. God says in his vision to Paul, Hey Paul, I am with you. I am with you. There's something about that phrase that just hearing it calms our fears. Do you remember Psalm 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Yeah. When we go through the valley, when we go through the difficulty, God is with us. It's, it's a help to know that God is with us when we need help with our fears. But what does Paul do before the end of chapter 18 of our text? He develops relationships with people God puts in his path. Aquila and Priscilla are introduced, and, and Paul gets to know them. They have this, this common tent-making ministry, right? And, but then it says, Paul goes and he preaches solely, so he stops making tents. He leaves Aquila and Priscilla. He's still living with them. He's still staying with them. They're taking care of him. My read on this, they're making the money, and Paul's doing the preaching. That's what I'm reading. I could be reading too much in there. But it goes on where uh, Aquila and Priscilla assist Paul through many parts of his ministry. Later on, they would meet up at, at Eph Ephesus, and Aquila and Priscilla would do ministry there as well as Corinth. And then Paul would move on. That was Paul's style, wasn't it? Then there's Apollos that comes to Ephesus, and later Paul crosses paths with him. Then there's Timothy, Luke, Barnabas, Silas, John, Mark, and the rest of the apostles. Each one Paul is raising up, and, and he does all of this knowing that the Lord is with him and with us. He has confidence in that. Listen to this from 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not give us a, given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of, uh, uh, but of power and of love and of self-discipline. He has not given us a spirit of fear. We need to know that God is with us. For four years, some in our country have chosen to fear our current president. Now, a different group will fear our president-elect if everything works out the way things are happening. Whether your president got elected or not, your candidate, I should say, you cannot let these days change anything in your relationship with God because it doesn't matter who's president. It doesn't matter who's in office. What matters is that God uses all things. And God has a plan. God has a plan, and it's being instituted, even when we shake in our boots. Anybody shaking in your boots a little bit this week? Yeah, I bet you did. I bet you did. I might have a time or two myself. God is with us. Uh, let's look at the third one of four. The third one is interesting. I uh, wasn't quite sure what to do with it at first, but I saw it. No one is going to attack you. No one is going to attack you. That's what God says in this vision. Or harm you, he says in the scripture. No one is going to attack you or harm you. Three verses later, after this vision, some people in the, per in the synagogue persecute Paul. So if I'm Paul, I'm going, hey, uh, God, I thought you said, you know, I could see, but Paul doesn't do any of this, but I, I could see myself just saying, Lord, I, maybe they didn't stone me, 
But words hurt too. They're persecuting me. They're dragging me before the magistrate. It was a united attack. Well, did God really mean no one would attack or harm you? Yes, he did. But God was trying to speak into Paul's life. In Paul's case, Paul's like, at least I'm not going to be stoned and left for dead outside the town, right? You see, Crispus was a synagogue ruler who earlier turned to Christ right there as a, as a Jew. So they didn't throw stones, but sometimes uh, when people come against you, it's like this Sosthenes, this other synagogue ruler. So you have Crispus, a synagogue ruler who came to Christ. Then later it references Sosthenes, who took Paul and probably the others before Gallio, the magistrate. And it's these two synagogue rulers that probably had a little tug of war. I think about that. Now, they don't really speak to this at all in this passage. But think about this. It says when, when Paul left the synagogue because they wouldn't receive his message, where did he go? Next door. I mean, 20 feet away. Probably further than that. But you get the point. It's like he's still here. And now all the people, all the Gentiles that were coming to our outer court area, now they're going over to Crispus' house, the synagogue leader. And so all of this is creating a conflict. So as soon as the proconsul throws this case out of court, right, they turn, people turn on Sosthenes, and they, they beat him. What does God mean when he says, no one can hurt you? What does that mean for you and me? What does it mean that no one can hurt you? God knows that sometimes we get sick. Sometimes uh, we're in harm's way. Before today is over, more people will die from violence in our country. Maybe even in our own county. Life is not fair, but God is good. Amen. And God is, God is trying to show through Paul that although no one's going to attack or harm him, he still had to face difficulties in life. Be careful. This is a war. And there is a heaven. And the big thing that God wants us to know, as he was speaking to Paul in that vision, it was unsaid, but you can hear it, at least I can. Paul, this is not your home. Heaven is your home. Listen, I like my house. Maybe you like your abode. But, but this is not our home. We need to remember that. God will help us through those times when we are attacked. Let me finish with number four. God says to Paul, I have many people for you. I have many people here. Verse 10. Third part, I have many people in this city, like Aquila and Priscilla. What an encouragement they were to Paul. It makes sense. They were both tent makers. We get to know Aquila and Priscilla even more. We'll look at them again in next week's messages. They are ministers for sure. Even the proconsul becomes friends with Paul. It doesn't say that, but the fact that he throws this out of court says that he either uh, was, did not have a good relationship with those at the synagogue, number one, or he just has a, a real a friendly spirit towards the followers of the way, as they were called at that time. He had a friend with the proconsul. I, I love the part of this passage where it says, Paul got up to speak. Remember, that's what Paul does. And he talks a long time. Listen, I am not like Paul in this way. I have never had anyone fall out of a window when I preached and died. Okay? Just give me that. Just give me that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I forgot where I was going with that. I got a little too excited about that. Um, man, I just lose it. Oh, uh, yeah. The, the magistrate... He, he gets up and he quiets Paul. Paul gets up to speak. And the magistrate says, sit down, son. I could just see him saying that. Sit down, son. Now, they didn't have that kind of relationship, mind you, but 
But Paul couldn't speak. The magistrate spoke for him. That's, that was a good moment. People are speaking for you. When he said that, and Paul's quiet, and everything got resolved, and they got thrown out, Paul going, oh, I didn't even think. I didn't even have to say anything. Sometimes we don't have to say anything. Someone else speaks for us. Someone is still speaking up. But maybe they speak for us. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a, a, an example of when one time someone spoke up for our church. Again, at the Linden Church. We had totally relocated our whole church north of the town. We sold this uh, little clapboard church to the senior center. And then they started to play bingo in the sanctuary. We had to work through that one. But, but uh, uh, it was not our building anymore, right? And, and so we went out to this property on the north side of town. And within two years of us building a new church, a whole subdivision was built around the church. A whole new mission field. It was pretty cool. We didn't even know that was going to happen. And so here we have these 15 acres. We're going to put this new building on this land. And, and so as, as we went through the whole building project, we went to the township, uh, Phil, our trust, head trustee, and I went to the township and said, we don't have water and sewer. The city is right across the street, this Linden, uh, this Linden Road in the middle of Linden, Michigan. Uh, they had city on one side, township on the other. So we approached the city and they said, we can't give you water or sewer, even though the water is just on the other side of the double line of that road. By policy, we can't. We said, come on. I even said, please. And they said, no. And so we did what we had to do. We went to the township. They said, we don't offer water and sewer in that part of the township. We said, well, we're putting in a preschool as part of our vision. I love that stuff. A brand new 100-person Preschool meets in that church today. But we had to have sprinklers. And you can't have sprinklers without it on the well. You couldn't do it if you know, don't you, Brad? And so we had to have uh, regular water. Uh, not, not well water, but city water. So we did what we had to do. We went to the state and we filed to have our property um, adjoined onto the city. Well, they draw big lines when they do that with the state. And so Phil and I had to go up to Lansing and face some lawyers and sit before the magistrate there and ask them uh, to annex this part of the property to the city, then the city would give us water and sewer. Well, the township who said they weren't going to give us water and sewer before, all of a sudden they show up at the hearing and they're upset because we're now taking away tax property from their township and putting it in the city. That wasn't our goal. Phil and I sat there before the judge, and these lawyers for the township said, oh, we were planning on bringing water and sewer to the church all along. <laughs> and they were sitting there going, oh boy, what do we do now, right? And so the judge, this is what the judge did. This is so cool. Phil and I drove back from Lansing. We lost the case, and we were not annexed to the city. What do we do? Oh, we went back happy. Let me tell you the rest of the story. All of a sudden, the judge spoke for us. He said, because you're a charter township, you can block this because of your commitment. So here's what we're going to do. Before the church finishes their building, you have to have sewer and water sitting in front of their church when they finish the building. If you don't have water and sewer in front of their church, you will have to put in a temporary sewer, catch basin. You'll have to pay for their well until they get uh, their, the water before them. He said, and he put that all in official document. We drove home going, did we just lose? You know, God took care of us. Dear friends, God is defending us. God is showing us. I have many people in this city. Half of those people may not have been believers. I don't know. But God used them for our, on our behalf. Oh, let me bring this to a close. Let me simply say that we are living in fearful days. And we need these assurances that there are people for us. The assurance that God is always with us. The assurance that not only is no one going to harm you, but no matter what happens, you're a citizen of heaven. You're a citizen of heaven. Never forget that this world cannot harm you. 
Because this world is not your home. And the assurance that God has so many people lining up. There are people lining up to help you. Did you know that? It's like a line for the Harbor Impact uh, food line. They are lining up just to help you. Because that's what God does. When God says, fear not, Paul. He says the same to you and me. Fear not. Yesterday. Maybe the day before. I'm not sure when it happened. Yesterday, when Biden was announced as president-elect, some of people in our country just rejoiced, and others grieved. That is our system, isn't it? Happens every four years. But God knows exactly what he's doing. He knows what's best for us. He knows how to bring a heavenly recipe to us. And we've got to trust him. We've got to trust Him for all of these things. What's next for the Free Methodist Church? I've got one of my church leaders asking me recently, Pastor, I feel like you've stopped dreaming. And they're right. I kind of have. I've been busy doing COVID-19 recovery, right? We need to dream again. We need to dream again, and I know that. Because God wants to take us places we've never been before. And He doesn't want us to be. I want us to sing a song and close it. This whole song set is from last week. I felt convicted we should do it. And uh, the closing song is, Is He Worthy? This song, ladies, come, assist us. It's a song we've sung many times. And this time when we sing it, it's kind of a responsive reading. As we sing it, just think about where God's taking you and what He's providing for you in the words of this song.